forth into the hot sunshine of Nairobi. A tour that was to bring them in close contact with the many peoples of the British Commonwealth. Here, at the foot of Mount Kenya, they were to have spent a short holiday in the hunting lodge that was the wedding present to them from Kenya Colony. For two days, the royal couple relaxed in the grounds of their house that stands almost on the equator. This is London. It is with the greatest sorrow that we make the following announcement. At 10.45 today, February the 6th, 1952, the king passed peacefully away in his sleep earlier this morning. The BBC is now closing down for the rest of the day, except for the advertised news bulletins and summaries, shipping forecasts and gale warnings. This is Frank Gillard speaking from Nairobi. I saw our new queen shortly after nine o'clock this morning. How tragic to think that even though she was on the veranda at treetops, looking out on the wild animals of Africa, going about their strange ways in the moonlight, that at such a moment she should become queen. How tragic to think that even this morning, as she sat at breakfast, talking about her father and proudly describing how bravely he'd stood up to his illness and how well he'd recovered, even at that moment, her father was lying dead and she had succeeded to his vast responsibilities. Some members of the royal entourage, including the new Queen's private secretary, Mr. Martin Charteris, left the lodge in order to have lunch at the Outspan Hotel from which the treetops excursion usually starts. Mr. Charteris had had his lunch when a press man called him back. An agency flash had that moment been received saying that the King was dead. There was no confirmation at about 2.45 local time, the truth was known. The Duke went to the princess and broke it to her. In the words of a member of the household, she bore it like a queen. It was a tragic homecoming, on the same spot where, a week ago, there had been a happy departure. In moving contrast to that occasion, there stepped down from the plain a figure in mourning. Elizabeth II, Queen of this realm and of all her other realms and territories, head of the Commonwealth, defender of the faith. Next day, St. James's Palace was the scene of the reading of the proclamation following the Queen's attendance at the Accession Council meeting. The proclamation was read by the Garter King of Arms, Sir George Bellew. With one voice and consent of tongue and heart, publish and proclaim that the high and mighty Princess Elizabeth Alexandra Mary is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become Queen Elizabeth II. Many Londoners also gathered near the Royal Exchange to hear it read there. Bless the royal princess Elizabeth II with long and happy years to reign over. For six hours, flags flew at full mast to salute the queen. Then, Glam's Castle, birthplace of the queen mother, was among those places where flags were down again to half mast. And as at Glam's, so in Dundee and throughout the United Kingdom. The procession slowly drew away from Sandringham House. Alongside the gun carriage walked men of the King's Company Grenadier Guards. Lining the route were the people of Norfolk. King George VI was leaving his favourite home for the last time. Behind the coffin, in the first car, came the Queen, the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret. Together they had attended a short service in Sandringham Church, just before the coffin left its resting place there. 
just over an hour after the procession set out from Sandringham, for the coffin was transferred to the special train that took it to London. On its way to the capital of the realm, the train travelled through three English counties, and along the lanes of Norfolk, Cambridgeshire and Hertfordshire, the people gathered for their own personal farewell. Three minutes after the train's arrival, Her Majesty the Queen, the Queen Mother, and Princess Margaret stepped onto the platform. It is very simple, this lying in state of a dead king. High above, all light and shadow and rich in carving, is the massive roof of chestnut that Richard II put over the great hall. From that roof, the light slants down in clear, straight beams, unclouded by any dust, and gathers in a pool at one place. There lies the coffin of the king, the oak of Sandringham, hidden beneath the rich golden folds of the standard. The slow flicker of the candles touches gently the gems of the imperial crown. Never safer, better guarded, lay a sleeping king than this, with a golden light to warm his resting place, and the muffled tread of his devoted people to keep him company. They come from a mile away in the night, moving pace by pace in hours of waiting, come into the silent majesty of the scene and to silently leave again. <laughs> 